the topic of our discussion this afternoon actually has its origins almost 20 years ago. In fact, on April 20th, 1999, the school shooting incident in Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, radically transformed law enforcement practices. And in fact, and you remember that event, from that incident forward, no longer would law enforcement officers, frontline law enforcement officers, wait outside of a crisis point, whether that was a school, a church, a mall, while offenders were actively slaughtering our civilians inside. No, the new model from that point on is the first responding officers that arrived at the scene, we would form up into contact teams, we would rapidly insert them into the crisis point, and their mission is to locate isolate and stop the threat, to stop the killing in the shortest time period possible. And for about the last 20 years, law enforcement has continued to evolve our practices and our strategies to be able to respond to these types of events, to be able to manage them effectively. But there's another lesson that was lurking in the aftermath of the Columbine incident. And that is a lesson that has still taken law enforcement, fire, and EMS almost 20 years to be able to discover the gravity of this lesson. And to introduce this lesson to you, I'm going to tell you a story. And the story is about a man by the name of Dave Sanders. Now, Dave Sanders was a teacher at Columbine High School. He'd been there for 25 years. He was a teacher of the economics and the science program. And he was the beloved longtime coach of the girls' basketball and baseball teams. And on that fateful day in 1999, Dave Sanders was in the school close to a very crowded cafeteria when the gunman entered the school and began firing. And Sanders, alerted to the sound of the gunfire and recognizing the significance of that threat, urgently attempted to herd the students out of the cafeteria. And by all accounts, he was able to get approximately 100 students out of the cafeteria before the gunman arrived at that location. And Sanders ran up a flight of stairs to the second floor of the school, and as he was moving rapidly down the hallway, he was struck from behind by gunfire. Hit by three rounds, one in the torso, one in the neck, and one in the head. And a seriously injured and profusely bleeding Dave Sanders collapsed into a nearby classroom. And in that classroom were a number of students and a teacher that were huddled in there, sheltering themselves in place from the danger. And they desperately attempted to give Dave the care that he needed to try to stop his bleeding. While well, they waited for help to arrive. And they waited. And they waited. And one of the students in the classroom took a portable whiteboard. And on that whiteboard, she wrote these words one bleeding to death, one bleeding to death. And she took that board and propped it up in the window facing out, hoping that somebody outside would see this sign and send help. And they did see the sign. And approximately three hours later, when the first responders arrived at the classroom, Dave Saunders had perished, a victim of uncontrolled hemorrhage. Now, I want to be clear, Dave Saunders was not the only victim at Columbine that day who would die from potentially survivable wounds as a result of uncontrolled blood loss. There were other individuals who also perished from the same cause. And Columbine is not the only incident that teaches us this lesson. What we find when we look at after-action reports of these incidents, incident after incident, is there is a lesson that is telling us that there is a problem because people with survivable wounds are dying before we're getting emergency care to them. Navy Shipyard, Virginia Tech, Aurora, Colorado. Time would fail me if I were to attempt to list all of the incidents that are trying to teach us this lesson that we need to learn. In the trauma field, they have a number and it's an important number and one that we should remember, and that number is 60 minutes. Because 60 minutes is what's determined to be the time period for optimal survivability 
And what that they mean by that is from the time that someone experiences trauma to the time we get them to an advanced medical care facility, that window needs to be within 60 minutes. And that's a very important number to remember. But there's another number that I want you to think about. And that number is 10. Because 10 minutes is the average amount of time that an individual with uncontrolled bleeding will bleed out and perish if efforts are not undertaken to stop that bleeding. And then there's another number, and that number is three. Three is the average number of minutes that it will take for someone experiencing massive arterial bleeding to bleed out and perish if efforts are not undertaken to stop that hemorrhaging. So these are three important numbers, and I'm going to come back to them again. 60, 10, and 3. Our goal in thinking about the importance of those numbers, our goal is this, that when one of these events occurs, whether it's an active shooter event or a blast event or whatever the cause of harm is, is that not a single person at that scene will die from potentially survivable injuries before we get them transported to a medical facility. That not a single person with survivable wounds will die before we get them to a medical facility. But in order to accomplish this goal, we need to take a look at something. And that look is our current state. What is the current situation in law enforcement, in emergency response, that is blocking us from, prevent, from attaining that goal. And this is typified by what I call the silo syndrome. And if you've been a law enforcement officer for more than 10 minutes, you understand what the silo syndrome is, is we have law enforcement agencies that typically we have our training and our practices and our procedures to an event like this, right? We have fire that has their practices and procedures to respond, and then we have EMS with their practices and procedures. But when one of these events happens, all of a sudden what we try to do is we tip these silos and we try to jam them together to hopefully have some kind of an effective interagency response to this event. And more frequently than not, what do we see is we see a very fractured, uh, inefficient, disconnected response that results in a huge delay in getting emergency care to people at the scene. We'll take a look at what happens when one of these events comes in. Well, typically the very first thing when an active shooter event occurs is we will deem the whole scene around that crisis point a hot zone, right? A danger zone. And the only resources that we will send into that zone are armed law enforcement officers. And that makes perfect sense. But while that event is occurring, what we have inbound is massive amounts of resources from fire, EMS, and they will stage in a safe zone on the outside of that perimeter, and they will wait. And they will wait until law enforcement deems the scene safe, at which point they will enter and attempt to do casualty care of the injured people. 60, 10, 3. Do you see where I'm going? This is a race against the numbers. And we have to look at what is a response that uh, we can adjust and have a better outcome to these types of events. And what it requires is a paradigm shift. In law enforcement, we need a, another radical paradigm shift and we also need it in fire and EMS in how we respond to these types of incidents. And that paradigm shift requires two fundamental principles that I want to talk to you about. The first one is unified command, and the second is the deployment of rescue task force into the crisis point. Now, I could ask each one of you in here what your definition of unified command is. And what I know I would get is as many varied answers as there are people in here. But unified command is extremely simple. We don't need to overthink this. Unified command is simply this. It is the physical co-location of the frontline responders, frontline supervisors from each of the responding agencies. 
the physical co-location typically of the police sergeant, the police supervisor, the battalion chief or the fire captain and the EMS supervisor coming together at the same location, looking each other in the eye, communicating face to face and beginning to solve complex problems for this situation. We establish incident priorities, we establish agency priorities, we'll create perimeters, staging areas for resource access and egress zones. And one of the first priorities for unified command is to establish hot, warm, and cold zones. A hot zone is simply this. A hot zone is that area where we know that there's an active threat or we believe there to be an active threat. It's a zone of danger. And the only emergency responders typically that we will send into a hot zone are armed law enforcement officers. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the cold zone. And the cold zone is that area where we know there's no threat. Perhaps it's been searched, it's been cleared, it's been contained, but we know there's no threat in the cold zone. And any emergency responder can operate freely and safely in the cold zone. But now between the hot zone and the cold zone, and this is where a radical shift needs to occur in law enforcement, is the unified command needs to establish a warm zone as soon as possible. And what a warm zone is, is a, a, an area where we have no intelligence, we have no information to make us believe that there's an active threat, but the area has not been searched, it's not been cleared, so there is a possibility that a threat may present itself. And it's into the warm zone that the unified command will send uh, resources in, rescue task force teams in, in order to begin emergency care. So concurrent with the establishment of hot, warm, and cold zones, and you understand what I mean by concurrent, we have sequential action, and we have concurrent action, meaning at the same time. So concurrent with the establishment of hot, warm, and cold zones, the Unified Command will establish casualty collection points. These are simply areas, locations within the crisis point, typically on the boundaries of the zones, the hot zone and the warm zone and the warm zone and the cold zone, where the rescue task force teams will move or extricate injured people too. They will drop them at the casualty collection point where they will be quickly triaged and then transported to a medical facility. Now concurrent with hot warm zone establishment, concurrent with casualty collection points, Unified Command will now establish and deploy rescue task force teams into the warm zone. What's a task force? Well quite simply a task force is bringing together separate resources with specialized skills into one team to accomplish one mission. The bringing together of specialized resources into one team to accomplish a mission. So in our context of an active shooter event, a rescue task force is combined of law enforcement officers, fire, and EMS coming together to send in to the warm zone and their mission that we give them is you will go through that warm zone, you will locate casualties, you'll provide emergency life-saving care and then you will extricate them as quickly as possible to the nearest casualty collection point. As a rescue task force team moves through the warm zone, the job, the duty of law enforcement is to provide 360 degree force protection or armed cover to the medical element of that task force team. And as they continue to move through the warm zone, they will encounter casualties. When they do, law enforcement maintains that 360 degree force protection and the medical element of that team goes to work. They will conduct emergency hemorrhage control, bleeding control, typically by the use of the application of tourniquets, hemostatic agents, battle dressings. They'll do some urgent airway management and then they will use a portable carry device, put that casualty on it and rapidly begin to extricate them to the nearest casualty collection point. Once they get that casualty there, they drop them 
their duty to that person now being done because someone else will take the care from there and that rescue task force team will do an about face and they'll go back into the warm zone and they'll get another casualty and they'll bring them out as quickly as possible. And as many ra rescue task force teams as we need to accomplish this goal, they will continue that cadence of bringing injured people out of the warm zone to casualty collection points until we've got every single injured person out. We need another paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift has to do with the mindset of our civilians. Because often, when one of these types of events happens, the mindset of the, our civilians is they think of themselves as victims caught up in uncontrollable circumstances. We need to change that mindset so that they think of themselves as responders with a vital role to play in the success of the survivability. If we think of survivability as a three-link chain, at the end of that chain is trauma care, right in an advanced facility, a hospital, emergency department, when we get that person to that facility. The middle chain of the survivability is the use of rescue task force as a rapid deployment to go and get those injured people out. But listen, the first link in that chain and a vital link in that chain is having the civilians who are caught up in this situation with those injured people at the, their point of wounding to immediately begin to provide care and bleeding control of these individuals. Why is that important? 60, 10, 3. And this is where a program such as Stop the Bleed, which is a federal program, is doing great work. I'd encourage you, if you don't know about this program, take a look at Stop the Bleed. But they have two overarching goals. And the first goal is to get our civilian population to change their thinking from victimology to immediate responder and giving them some basic skills that they need to be able to provide emergency care, rapid bleeding control to keep these people alive while first responders are trying to get to them. But I want to ask you a question. Are you prepared, if you find yourself in one of these situations, to be an immediate responder? Are your significant others prepared to be an immediate responder? What about your children? Have you spoken to and trained your children and given them the necessary skills to rather than being a victim, to be a first responder in one of these incidents? And I want to commend to you this resource, and I'd encourage you to go to this website, joinipsa.org, and download this document. This document is the Rescue Task Force Best Practices Guide. It's just recently been published. This guide is the culmination of over a year's worth of heavy lifting by some of police, fire, EMS, and dispatches, uh, most knowledgeable leaders in this area. And you can use this as a resource to help you plan, implement, operationalize, and sustain a unified command rescue task force program in your municipality. And so I'll, what I want to ask you in closing is, what are you prepared to do with this information? What will you do now? So when you go back to your municipality and your agencies, what action steps can you take and will you take to redeem the golden hour? To help ensure that we have fewer and fewer Dave Sanders stories to tell. Thank you very much.